Good evening, campers, dreamers, and babysitters. And yes, we have a very special uh, treat for you guys. This was super exciting, came together rather quick, but uh, was in planning and preparation for quite some time. Today, we are getting the lucky chance to sit down and talk with the director and producer of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. Yes, this was uh, very exciting for us. I mean, we're, we're looking forward to this zany, uh, out there film for sure. It's coming to all of us uh, by the time this comes out. It'll be here on um, this upcoming Wednesday on the 15th here in the States. It's already premiered in Mexico. But uh, yeah, man, this was such a treat. I was so happy that this came together. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's again, another great interview, I think, on our part. So yeah, and I mean, this one we've discussed several times uh, on the channel. Initially, when it was first announced, I believe we covered it. It's one of the first topics we covered on the Sunday Scaries. Uh, so it's, it's it's very fun to see this uh, while well, us still doing this and, and sticking with it yeah. and being able to finally cover this film with all the news that's been coming out. You know, as soon as it, its initial announcement, there were always two camps people who were really into it and people that absolutely hated it and didn't think you should be doing um, this kind of um, horror twist to such a pop culture icon. And, uh, you know, we're finally going to see this here um, this coming week. And I mean, that discourse is only going to grow once this film is actually out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's so great to be able to pick these uh, these guys brain on just not only how they came up with the concepts, um, again, some of that discourse that they got. I mean, we cover a, a wide array of topics with these guys in uh, what was really just a half hour. Like we could only get them for a little bit, but they were super generous with their time as always. It seems like everybody, you know, you, you, they give you a time frame, but it seems like we've been lucky enough that everybody's been kind enough with us to, you know, go over a little bit on that and, you know, just give us a little bit more insight. Um, there were a couple of things, you know, that they held close to the chest, but we'll get into that. Um, I'm sure more information will drop as the film releases, and I'm excited to get those uh, questions answered. But yeah, they really go deep with us on just the creative side of things. Obviously, you know, us, we're going to go kind of uh, in depth on just what it took to make a project like this and really where it came from. And yeah, I, I just had a lot of fun talking to these guys. They're seriously a great interview, uh, entertaining, and they're just uh, just as excited about this, uh, you know, property and what uh, it's kind of become uh, with the Internet here. And, you know. We say it just about every single time we have one of these interviews, but, you know, the last two years here in horror, they presented a lot of great opportunity for smaller budget films to get up on the big screen. And uh, whether you're in that camp that likes this or not, you got to say it's it's a big win just to have something like this that you'd kind of expect to go right to DVD or on streaming playing in theaters. So another win for horror in my book. Yeah, I mean, and it's really intriguing because, like you said, you know, normally you would just think that this would go straight to streaming, but since uh, horror's just been having, you know, a stellar last year here, where it's like um, we get to see a lot of this stuff in the theater and experience it uh, with several other moviegoers. So, um, Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey was always something, you know, I was intrigued by. I didn't really know how that one was going to turn out. And I still don't know because we haven't been able to check it out yet, but I'm very intrigued and I am excited to go see this in the theater. Absolutely. So I guess without further ado, we'll just hop right into it. So here is our interview with uh, the director and producer of Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey. All right, <laughs> guys. Well, we might as well get things started here. Um, you know, obviously first things first, congratulations on the movie and uh, congratulations on the, uh, the premiere in Mexico. How was that for you guys? Oh, thanks so much. Yeah, it was absolutely surreal. We, when we got there, a load of the cast and crew came with us, and they just met, they made such a big deal out of it, and it was so fun, wasn't it? We had like there was people like dressed as Winnie the Pooh running around. Oh, wow. um, loads of people in cosplay. Um, <laughs> they had all this set build there, so like this tunnel of, with like hundred acre wood signs. 
eel rest in peace and yeah we didn't expect it to be that sort of scale yeah uh, the the, the set design that they did for the premiere was better than our set design There's yeah. Just more budget, <laughs> so. yeah they have more budget than we did <laughs> yeah it looks way that's better. crazy <laughs> we wanted to that's take awesome. some <laughs> i i can yeah, imagine I so definitely like a souvenir <laughs> There you go. Yeah, no, that's definitely. And I got I got some questions about that as we uh, continue on here. Another thing I wanted to mention, I saw there was an article. I wonder if you guys can confirm this is that uh, yeah. it's made almost a million dollars in Mexico already. Yeah. So at the moment, it's been out in Mexico for probably one and a half weeks. Um, and yeah, the box office number at the moment over there should be about over one million dollars, which is mad because Mexico, their cinema tickets are so cheap. Like I didn't, I didn't realize when we we're there that they they're literally like three dollars. So you can imagine oh, they've wow. needed like yeah over three hundred thousand people to uh, to attend it, which is crazy. And they're really happy. In our opening That's weekend, awesome. we were like in between Megan and Avatar, which is crazy. And like obviously, <laughs> Meg Megan's been out for a while, so it's not like mm. like for likes. It's not an opening weekend, but still, it's like pretty surreal considering their budget was. You know, probably over ten million, like twelve million or so, <laughs> and ours wasn't. That's so. <laughs> that's nuts. Yeah, and Scott, how are you feeling about all this? It's absolutely crazy, you know. Like um, when when we set out to do it, it was genuinely this cheap little film, and we were like, oh, let's just um, you know, we 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 try. Basically, we we like with my whole producing career, I've set out to kind of like for the age of thirty, I wanted to do a hundred feature films. And once I did that, I was like, right, now let's make some go viral. So, like, find, like, really hooky stuff that will kind of make it. So I'm that type of producer where people go, oh, you did that film. And then hopefully then it will take me to the next level because, you know, I'm, like, we're totally untrained, the pair, pair of us. We didn't go to film school. Everything we know is just from watching horror films or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like I'm very aware, like, when I go into rooms to pitch for, like, proper budgets, it's like, you know, the person before me has probably had a short film in Sunday dance and it's always been that whole thing of like how to stand out and then finally one really hit and yeah it's, it's mad it's we're yeah. so grateful for it aren't we yeah we started going a bit more um like scott was saying hook and concept driven and then whilst accompanying that we wanted to make the quality at a certain level so that's why things like you know when, when it first got announced a lot of people were saying oh the concept and hook's good but i'm sure it's just going to look absolute shit um and then when the trailer came out we saw a lot of people were like this actually looks good like this, <laughs> this could be cool and uh awesome. yeah so we got like a really good cinematographer on board um so it looks like really really cool the soundtrack's really really good so it's and a lot of people have been like messaging me on instagram particularly from like latin america after seeing it and saying just yeah they've really enjoyed it they've really liked it so yeah it's it's going well <laughs> perfect man that's great to hear um so kind of going into you kind of answered some of my what my kickoff question was going to be here after the the mexico stuff but it was um what was the uh, the kind of spark that got you guys wanting to do Winnie the Pooh? Was it the fact that it kind of went into the public domain? Or was this something like you guys kind of sat down and were like, we want to kind of um, inject some horror into a classic character. What's out there? Uh, like, really, what, what made you guys land on Winnie the Pooh? So, yeah, it's kind of like what we were just saying, where we're, we're very concept and hook driven. And... Mm -hmm. We're always looking for these these um, monsters and these villains, which aren't the kind of um, typical ones. You know, we don't really want to do like zombies and werewolves and ghosts because it's just littered. There's there's so many of them out there. We wanted to be a bit unique and find something which would make you, when you hear about it, would make you go, "What the hell is that? Like, how have they done that?" Um, so we came up with a bit of a slate of concepts and one of those was was Winnie um, and it joined that slate because we realized it went in the public domain so we were like okay this is possible to do now um, and then we just had a conversation we we're like would we want to see a Winnie the Pooh horror movie and we were both like yeah that'd be amazing mm -hmm. so then <laughs> then we just started running with it we got the costume got everything sorted and yep but we, we'd already been doing like um so we, we actually just before Winnie we've been doing like nursery rhymes so we were doing like Humpty Dumpty and we did Jack and Jill and stuff like that. So we'd already been kind of like going from like originally, like a lot of my horror films were kind of like monster movies, like dinosaurs and kind of whatever was being requested because we do like we've, we, we very much listen to what our investors want or whatever. Um, and yeah, then we started kind of like 
we, we started financing some things ourselves like Humpty Dumpty and all that and then yeah naturally it just kind of went into Winnie the Pooh we saw it went into the public domain and we were like you know we we're both massive slasher fans like Jason Voorhees and all that kind of stuff and we were like cool what can we do but yeah so that's kind of really how it went that's awesome and uh, I'll pass things over to Luke here he's got the next question for us and then I know like um I, being a creator there's going to be criticism on anything that you do um especially with something like this it's already been like a I guess a pop culture icon that's already ingrained for so many decades um and then once this thing got announced I mean it really did catch fire just even by that initial announcement and I mean you had you pretty much had two camps where it was like um you know Dylan and I are in like yeah let's do this it sounds exciting <laughs> And then you have other people that, you know, grew up with Winnie the Pooh and they're like, why are you doing this to the character? So you had that criticism to start and then the trailer comes out. And now the film's coming out. I'm sure it's just heightened even more. How do you guys deal with that criticism? And then also, was there ever this hesitation during that creation to be like, mm, maybe we're pushing the line too much? No. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So yeah, basically we... Um... You're right, it's extremely controversial. Uh, from the outset, when it started to go a bit viral, um, we straight away started getting a lot of like Instagram messages um, on like Facebook, just everywhere. And there were, you're right, there's two schools of people. It's a bit like Marmite. It's like some people were like, this is the best thing. This is amazing. It's so different. It's such a cool concept. Um, and then other people were saying, we're the devil. We're pure evil. There was petitions getting made to stop it. Someone wanted to call the police on us recently. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my is, God. Yeah, yeah but, but we got this message and it was like, oh, so it was like, oh, hi, Scott, just to let you know, someone's trying to ring the police about Bambi. And I was like, eh, go on then. <laughs> what are you gonna do? They're not going to care. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was pretty, so it's, it's been so divided and you're right. As soon as like people started seeing it in the cinema, it's, it's all, it's still the same. Like there's, um, there's another divide there again where, you know, horror fans like really like it um, typically, but it's more the people who really are kind of like protective of like the Disney version of um, Pooh. They don't want to see him made into this like monster. Um, so we, it's just been accelerating we're getting more and more hate as it's going on and i'm sure in seven days when it kind of has its proper worldwide release because two yeah, weeks ago it was, only, it was only mexico and we already got bombarded from that and when the rest of the world sees it it's just going to be like 10 times that i think so. but, the, but the thing is it's kind of like um you know like from my point of view it's like you know we genuinely we aren't going out there like well, I know I'm not. I think Reese is a bit more cheeky than me, but like I'm not going out there trying to upset anyone. It's like this film does not need to exist to them. Like you, you know, you can allow it to exist, or you can mm -hmm. just go, you know what? I've got my version of Winnie, but like this is Reese's version that he wants. Like he doesn't like happy films. He wants. He don't watch any comedies. He hates it. So like you know, this is Reese's Winnie. So you know, it, you don't have to watch it and stuff. But yeah, we've been getting like death threats. Uh, Reese in particular being told to kill himself and oh, okay. horrendous messages, like really horrible messages. Yeah. But um, Reese, you're quite, you wind people up, don't you? What yeah, do you I don't, honestly, I don't care. Like, it's, um, you have to be, I think when you're like a director or you're involved in film, you have to be pretty thick skinned because mm -hmm. no, no film is perfect. Like, every film is going to have people who hate it. Even the best film in the world, people will hate the best film in the world or whatever's viewed as the best film in the world. So you need to be able to just, you know, brush it off. And when <coughs> someone's, you know, throwing insults and even but like people who this is before the film was even released, we were just going, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. It's like you yeah. haven't even seen it. <laughs> it's not but, even but out. Also, it was um, something to comment on on like the concept as well. It was like recruiting people for this was really difficult because everyone and I, I totally get it like. There's, I'll be honest, there's no filmmaker other than really me and Reese that like care, like they, they, they're very like, we want to go and do our A24 films. Everyone pretty much in this industry is like, they want to make this the next bloody Midsummer or Hereditary. Whereas me and Reese, like that's later down the line. Like right now we know where we're at and we want to make films that we would want to watch and all that kind of stuff. Obviously mm -hmm. we, we're limited with our budget and stuff. Um, but yeah, it's kind of like even recruiting people for this, like Reese was really up against it. Like a lot of the actors that we usually use in our films, they didn't want to do it. And I know that on the day, like he was up against it with some of the creatives behind the camera because the, again, it's not real. Like, I totally get it. Like they're kind of going, what are we making? Like, you know, yeah, like, yeah. you know, they went to film school. They want to make bloody, you know, 
I don't know. Like, like, gra- like more like a lot of people gravitate towards like grounded, elevated horror, um, yeah. whereas this isn't elevated horror like <laughs> at all. <laughs> and, That's kind of been uh, the thing recently. Yeah, yeah, but we like that. Like, like I know I love that. It's like you know you go to the cinema and you watch a film to be like entertained and have fun. Yeah. Like it doesn't need this heavy dramatic tone underneath <coughs> it, um, which is, you know, it's a bit against the grain yeah. at the moment. That's what you that's... had to fight against though, wasn't it, Reese? Like on yeah. set, like some of the people behind the camera were really encouraging him to make the whole thing serious. And the thing is, like I kept, had to keep saying to Reese, like stick with your vision, like look at that costume. There's nothing serious about it. Like, you know, you have fun with the deaths, but like just know what you're making. Like Michael Myers, he just, looks creepy as hell winnie the pooh is winnie the pooh and it's like you know it's really important that reese like stuck with his vision and i feel like with the sequel oh guys it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna be what reese yeah. really pictures i think we're, yeah. we're so excited for the sequel because because of how well number one's done there is a um you know uh, following that you get kind of extra money so the budget has increased and um at the moment it's like at least four times what the um the original one was which yeah, is, it's gonna which be is wild. We want to kill like, like a hundred people in it. Like it's gonna be. Mad. You keep saying a hundred. I don't. I don't know if we yeah. can do a hundred. We will. We <laughs> I want to kill a lot. Like, a hundred is a lot of people. <laughs> it's like every minute. Um, awesome, awesome. And you know, uh, that was actually going into my next question too. Was, um, if you can say, what was your budget initially on this movie? So we're not saying just yet. When's this getting released? Okay. Uh, this is gonna be released. I'm hoping probably by Monday. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so, we can't yeah. say just yet, just because um, all the we don't want to say too much before the worldwide release. Um, however, after that, um, I'm going to be a lot more open, and you know, like probably two weeks after, um, I'm going to go into a lot of detail about you know some of the the challenges we had, mm. um, not just in terms of getting people on board to like believe in this and get it going, um, but also like financial constraints as well, because every like low budget film you you kind of have to wear loads of different hats so you know yeah. you'll see on the credits along even though i was like i ended up having to write produce and direct it like even on the day i was having to do the drones so i did a load of drones for it um i was kind of the vfx supervisor as well and i ended up doing some of the vfx afterwards i edited it like you have to be really multifaceted to make a low budget film or a low budget horror like this kind of get going because otherwise having someone dedicated to all of these different areas just swallows up so much of the budget that you can't really you don't really have much more to work with so it ends up being a bit rubbish we wouldn't um, be able to make it basically yeah, if we, if we actually yeah. Had them in all these roles we wouldn't be able to make it yeah yeah no i totally get that because like even us we do like we've done little short films here and there before we really got serious and started doing the podcast um yeah and it's just like yeah you're it, on our budget we're like we've got nothing we've got like 500 bucks maybe and it's just like yeah well let's just i'm doing everything and luke's doing everything so it's just yeah. kind of like we get that and i'm sure uh as you get uh up there with budgets and things like that you know it's like it's still very present with that um yeah. a part of that was and you can speak in broad terms um with this because i know you don't want to release too much and if you don't want to say anything about this i totally understand was the uh, social media kind of uptick when everything kind of caught fire and everybody was like, oh, wow, this is coming out. Like, this is going to be a real thing. How did that impact the film? Was this initially going to be like, maybe we put it out on streaming and then, yeah. you know, everything. And then it just kind of went, oh, wow, now we can put this in theaters. Or was it always the intent to do like a small Fathom events kind of, we're going to get it in theaters a little bit. So we always thought it was a strong idea and it was going to, have some element of being kind of viral and get out there like we thought it was going to be successful but nowhere near to the extent it has um i was imagining a much like probably a tenth of what it is or or even less um and it's far like exceeded that so the intention at the start was to that's why i was putting quite a bit of effort in, in towards like the cinematography and like a lot of stuff mm-hmm. in the principal photography because we thought it could get a small theatrical release like the primary market for it was tended to be straight to dvd um, but we thought you know it can get a small theatrical in some areas like one of another film called claw had something similar and it had a small theatrical in china so we wouldn't have got china because winnie but um mm-hmm. we thought oh maybe like it can have something like that then when things started to blow up on uh, online and it became viral and it started to get shared by variety and all entertainment weekly new york post lad bible all these huge companies we we knew 
we had a bit of a kind of winner on our hands and we then went back to the drawing board a little bit and thought okay what can we do now to transform it into more of a kind of theatrical movie um, and up the the production value um, and make it feel more more entertaining so we um yeah came up with some additional scenes done some additional reshoots for it um, which have really kind of added to the um added to the film overall but it's still in the same sort of spirit and tone as what the principal photography was like that hasn't really changed it's still got this like fun um silly side to it it's not just like dead serious um but we were able to do cooler things like cars exploding Heck yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> and uh, Luke, I'll throw it off to you now for your next one. All righty. Um, I was interested because I know both of you have screenwriting credits, and I know like screenwriting can be a daunting task. I'm a I'm a big fan of screenwriting, specifically when I watch films. I love to read screenplays, and you know, me and Dylan, we also write. Um, so like for both of you, uh, you can touch on Blood and Honey as well because I know kind of. Writing a monster movie is probably a little bit different than writing a slasher, as uh, you know I've done in the past. And it's like I found myself timing, you know, uh, Friday Thirteenth, the final chapter, and finding out when Jason kills everyone. So it's like, oh, it's like five minutes, and then I got to kill somebody else. Um, but so it's like I know getting that initial idea and, and then kind of getting it on paper is such the daunting task. It's like okay. I have my elevator pitch and now I've got to do uh, 90 to 100 pages and, and try to get everything that I need and hit all these points. I was just curious of both for both of you, what's kind of your habit in terms of writing? Once you get that idea, do you sit down for, you know, daily for four pages? And I'm like, OK, I just got to get this done. Or we have specific scenes that you just want to focus on. How does that kind of workflow go for you guys? So with Winnie, there was um, there was actually an initial script and I read it um for the like after i came back from like another another production and i realized <coughs> it was basically unfilmable because there are um the, the it went off on a bit of a tangent from what it initially was and there were a lot of elements in there which we weren't legally allowed to do so for example um the poo sticks that game um tigger and all of these elements they're not actually in the public domain so you're not allowed to use them yet but they were throughout the original like in elements of the original script um which wasn't wrote by me um and then i thought okay like this isn't this isn't possible like we can't this isn't a workable script at the moment so then that's when i was like okay, i need to like we're filming in um two or three weeks and i had to just start straight away and just like start rewriting it um literally completely from scratch and it became a different story so i was under a, a super tight deadline to get that um get that done it must have been within a week like the whole script needed to be fully locked and complete to go into principal photography that's yeah. not exclude that's excluding the um the reshoots because that happened at a later date and something i kind of do when i approach this is when you're on a lower budget um in the lower budget realm i really like to make sure it's kind of littered with with action and there's a lot of you know when you see a winnie the pooh film you want lots of winnie the pooh and part of that is because i feel like it can be done more successfully on those sort of budget ranges um relative to having other scenes which could be a bit more bit more boring if you've got a lot of people you know sat in um a bit of a a less interesting space like a bedroom talking or something like that instead it's funner to see Winnie the Pooh chasing someone in the woods um so I made sure he's in a lot of the film so in in Winnie the Pooh I mean as soon as you get to about 30 minutes in the movie I think he barely comes off screen like his screen time must be like 40 minutes or so which is crazy whereas when you look at like and part of what motivated me to do that was actually when I watched Halloween ends like last year and I was a bit disappointed when I watched that because of how little I saw Michael Myers he was only in like five or ten minutes of the film and it's like oh like I'm going to a Halloween film to watch Michael Myers basically um as a horror fan so I was like okay people who are going to Winnie the Pooh film are going to want to see Winnie the Pooh so I just made sure he was in a a, a big chunk of the film and I had other constraints when you're on these budgets where you know okay i can't afford loads of locations i can afford two locations um so i need to kind of 
write down all of these constraints like that, like Winnie the Pooh needs to be in all the time. The um, I have to get to this location. I've only got that location for three days, so I, it can only be in this much of the film. This location is the primary location for like the middle part, and then kind of think of a way of like bending the story amongst those constraints. So there are there was a lot of kind of like limitations for me. And uh, Scott, do you? What about you? Yeah. You wrote so, as well. Yeah. So like obviously we like there's kind of like a, a load of scripts that we've written. So stuff like, um, yeah, I do sit down and I kind of, I, my, my big thing is the treatment. As soon as that treatment's done, I'm all good. Like, cause that is really the bones. And I always see like the script itself is just putting fat on a bone. Really. It's like, as soon as you've got those ideas, you're, you're all good, but it's getting those ideas, getting that structure and like the, the act one, the act two, the, the act three and getting that, that arc of like someone that you've got to follow, really getting that fleshed out. And it can be really difficult because especially when like it's you know i produce about 30 films a year and i used to write all of the scripts because um i'd get writers in and they just would not be good with criticism they would not be good with notes they'd miss their deadlines and it's like i just work too quick to be like messing about with that whereas i can write a script in like if i wanted i can like the quickest i've written one is a day like i wrote a viking film in a day and i hate viking stuff so like that was quite a bit of a mission for me but um, it was not something I wanted to do at all. But it was like, if you can get the script in today and we like it, then we, we'll fund it and you can film it next week. And so I just did it. Um, but yeah, like I, I very much do kind of, I set myself tasks. Like, so for example, with Bambi, I'm writing that at the moment. And I've kind of set myself a mission of like, um, you know, the aim is 10 pages a day. Because again, like I'm it all, everyone's so different. But like once I've got my treatment, I'm very, I can go really quick with my script. Like it's not a thing for me. It's like I move really quick. The treatment is what takes me more time. Um, but yeah, like I set myself a task of 10, 10 pages a day sort of thing. And it's like, if I don't hit it, I'm normally about eight pages I've done or something. But yeah, I kind of do that. But then it's also quite difficult, like with um, VFX films, like, you know, for example, just talking about Bambi, it's really difficult because... You know, I've already got quotes. I want to get a, like a really top end VFX company for this. I don't want a cheap one. I want a really good one. But obviously it costs so much money and it's like you've got to be really careful like where you're going to put these VFX shots because ev like again like when I've had writers in before they they don't get it. It's like you no know, every time you see that creature that's about 1500 quid literally mm -hmm. every single time and it's like it's important that you don't just see it just like look at camera or do something you got you really use it wisely and it's it's just so difficult because in an ideal world like for example like i started writing bambi now and i've got kind of a a, a b plot like a b storyline and that is to keep it action-packed like there's another kind of hills of eyes-esque thing going on and um it's just to keep it active because you know as we said like you know, we're we're not at a point where like we can make a film that's like incredibly character driven. Like, you know, um, you know, we, that that's kind of like end goals. But at the minute, it's kind of like we know exactly the type of films we're making and like what people might want from it. I don't think they want to see someone crying over a dead boyfriend for forty minutes and then finally Bambi turns up. Do you know what I mean? Like, you want to see Bambi straight mm. away. Um, but yeah, with, with it though, it, it's um, hard because then you you send the script. Like, I sent my pages to an investor the other day. And then their feedback was, you know, it's very simple. It's it's Bambi, it's Jurassic Park meets Bambi. And I'm like, I know, but I'm allowed <laughs> X amount of shots. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's yeah. why I've got this subplot. And it's like, you know, I'm just trying to keep everyone happy and I'm trying to make a film that I would want to make. But it, you, yeah, you're in these like restraints. It's like, you know, in an ideal world, I would write whatever and Bambi would keep appearing and I wouldn't have this mm -hmm. B plot. But mm -hmm. as a writer, you have to be really like, there's a lot of factors to think about. And also just how are people going to shoot stuff on the day? Like there was a two fairy script that I was developing ages ago and the writer, he sent a script in and it was like the two fairy was like climbing on the ceiling and jumping down and picking people up and all this. And the budget of that was about 15,000 pounds. It was like, it, shocking budget and it was like how are we going to do this like it's yeah. not not a thing do you yeah. know what I mean yeah you have to like write to your constraints relative to the budget yeah. and uh yeah even with the what Scott's saying there's there's still constraints even when the budget goes up in terms of vfx because then the quality becomes better and that needs to then be factored in but something good for us now is 
we have dramatically reduced down the volume of films we're focusing on. And this year, there's only going to really be like four. So which yeah. is ticking on in the background and we can dedicate a lot more time to them um, in terms of, you know, the script and everything. So there's a much bigger kind of development time than what we've had before, which will yeah, I, I feel like really benefit the, the film at the end. Us, yeah, from the pair of us, it's like, the, like the, there was a whole business strategy to get to this point. And it was like, I didn't know what film this point would be. Like, I didn't know where it would come in. But obviously it's happening now, finally, after all this, like, all these films have done. Um, and now now we're there. It's like everything now changes in terms of, like, my my business structure for my, my company. And now it's about quality. Now it's about making the films that people really want. It's about making really creative death scenes. Like, with Reese, I feel like he, he genuinely is an incredibly talented director. But in Winnie One... I, I feel like you'll really get like um you'll get you'll get his flavour, but I feel like with this sequel, it that will be him. Like that will really be him. But it's because the budget constraints are kind of a lot less. He's gonna get the complete go ahead. Because I remember for, for Winnie won, he had some really dark ideas, but he got rejected by investors. <laughs> I like, can't really go dark. into them, but they were they were really bad. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, they were really brutal, and they got towed back. And like this is almost we don't know if we'd be able to distribute this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. He's, he's like, very like Terrifier-esque, wasn't yeah, it? Was yeah, like yeah. Oh, very nice. And yeah. they wanted to, uh, they, they're they very, with distributors, they're normally very um, cautious about like gore as well, because they're like, you know, some territories don't like it. You can't do certain things. Um, like even the Terrifier guy, I remember reading an interview from him and he was pulling back on certain scenes as well for mm -hmm. similar reasons. So yeah, we, we had to do that, but um, a little bit more extreme. But yeah, like what Scott was saying, even like with the death scenes, and I actually think the death scenes in Pooh, there's some really good ones and a lot of people like yeah, it's online really awesome. like a lot of the reviews and stuff they always say the death scenes are really like interesting and different and you know that's what a lot of horror fans really want from it yeah you're gonna get some really yeah. fun moments and, in there yeah, yeah and uh but even then it's like there are constraints because like you don't have a huge amount of time things can go wrong on low budgets all the time like one of the death scenes um was completely improv i had something like something in mind and i was like okay i'll do this this will happen this will happen then we got to the location we it's like okay you guys have three hours to or like two to three hours to do this whole sequence and this whole death scene and then when we were there it was like oh yeah the the, the location's been closed off or that part of where i wanted it has been shut down it's like oh fuck like so then it's like yeah. you have to really quickly look for an alternative um and look at the space and what's around you and that's where I saw this wood chipper um, on the farm site. I was like, can we use that? And then the guy was like, yeah, if you want to. So then we wheeled that in and that became one of the um, the, the, pieces, yeah, uh, yeah. the the vehicles which caused it. But to it's not only that, it's like, it's, it's all these elements. Like um, when, when it's like low budget filmmaking, it's like you're up against everything because these horror scenes, like they are the, they are so hard to film and you need to really have the shots in your head because it's like a puzzle piece like if you think like someone comes in a room and stabs someone the amount of shots required just to cover that versus two people sat on the sofa talking do you know what I mean two people sat on the sofa talking you could just do a wide close close done whereas like someone walking in a room then stab inside like, all these shots and he's kind of up against it because of the time but i feel like yeah he's got some incredibly fun deaths in this i yeah. think you can have a lot of fun with it some great That's stuff awesome Excited for people awesome to see yeah, definitely. And I guess we got time for one more question here. Um, and we'll keep it, you know, kind of short. I know you guys got a lot to do today. So um, my question was, you know, obviously, we've got Neverland Nightmares on the horizon, uh, Blood and Honey too, And now Bambi is uh, something that's going to be in there too. Is there going to be kind of like this MCU of almost this fairy tale horror <laughs> of like, maybe even like Freddy versus Jason at one point where we've got Bambi versus Peter Pan versus Winnie at some point down the road. You don't have to say too much, but is that kind of the intent here? Yeah, basically we're um we're we're not limiting this either just to Disney. So like a lot of, you know, these these some of these characters are, you know, they're synonymous with Disney already, like Bambi and Winnie, but the intention isn't just to go after their portfolio. Um there's a lot of other interesting stuff out there. <clears throat> which we're kind of diverting attention towards now. Um, and there's no reason they can't be in the same universe. Um, and mm -hmm. there's no there's no real negative to, to have them in kind of connected in the same world, because then you're right, it can lead into some really interesting scenarios. And a lot of people have, as soon as we briefly mentioned it at one point, and we were like, Winnie versus Bambi. And it was a little bit lighthearted. And we were like, you know, we don't know if we do it or not. But then so many people have been like, 
they really want that and they really want to see that. So uh, there might be the possibility for that in the future. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Scott. That's. Oh, that if you want to oh, say yeah, something no, about yeah. it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I echo it. And um, in Bambi, you're definitely going to see some Easter eggs for Winnie. Winnie's nearby. He might not make an appearance in it, but yeah, look out for it and you'll see it. It'll be in the woods awesome. somewhere, maybe. Watching. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Perfect. Well, that's about going to wrap us up here. I know, like I said, you guys got a lot to do today. So we appreciate you guys coming on the show and talking to us. Uh, we're super excited to see Winnie the Pooh next week. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I know Luke is. We're definitely going to be doing a review of that. Um, we got our tickets for next Wednesday, uh, earliest we could get, 7 o'clock. So um, is there, there's anything else you guys want to plug or say to our uh, fans or anything to get them out to the theater, feel free. Um uh, I don't think there's much more, but yeah, it, it comes out on the 15th of February. Um, it's mostly releasing in the evening, so 6 or 7 p.m., but it's in like 1,600 cinemas. So mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be one near you. Um, and if you don't manage to, if you're busy on the 15th, it is going to be carrying on at the moment until the 23rd in selected cinemas. But we're hoping that will expand. So, yeah, please go and watch and... it. <laughs> It'll be fun. Yeah, one, one little note that I wanted to say is um, we are we we read everything on Instagram. And we, we really, really want to make these films for people that love horror. So do message us anything that you liked, you didn't like about Winnie One. We, like, we, we're going to take it all on board. So do, just DM, DM us, we reply, and we will read all of it. Yeah, we take criticism awesome. well. So. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, oh, thanks, this guys. has been great. Uh, a big thank you to uh, Reese and Scott for sitting down with us and talking about this uh, this wonderful film. I mean, again, we haven't seen it, so I can't say, uh, confirm or deny how I feel about it, but damn, I'm excited. I mean, they just have so much energy about these ideas and, uh, you know, what their hopes are for the future that it, it's infectious, man. It's tough to just sit here and really not be excited for uh what is the winnie the pooh slasher film coming out so you know i i gotta say thank you again to those guys for just sitting down and really just uh letting us spitball a couple questions off of them they really i mean they gave such in-depth answers like they really ran with it and you know like that's something that it just makes our job a whole lot easier when you have people that are that receptive in interviews you know, and uh, these two are just absolutely relatable. You know, it's like a lot of the mm -hmm. things that they had talked about, I think, resonate with us personally as always trying to make films and then feeling, you know, the constraints by it and trying to stay in your own wheelhouse to make something creative, uh, but something also unique here, you know, and these guys clearly have an end game and they have their next probably few years planned out here as to oh, yeah. uh, what they what they want to um conceptualize and, and put on the screen and again we haven't seen the film but i'm in very intrigued to see what these guys are, are going to come up with because it's like again you hear winnie the pooh blood and honey and it's a horror twist uh, on winnie the pooh and you don't know what to think especially you know when there's not the biggest budget attached um and, and there's maybe a certain connotation there but like sitting down with these two and really picking their brains uh, I mean, these guys have great heads on their shoulders. Uh, they really have a, a very particular direction. So this makes me even more intrigued to actually see this film. Uh, me too. I mean, I'm definitely sitting here excited, uh, even more so than I was before. And yeah, I mean, we will be seeing it again on uh, February 15th. That is this upcoming Wednesday for us in the States. Um, yes, yeah, so we'll be getting you guys a review, of course, that night. So uh, keep your eyes out for that if you want to know our thoughts. Um, and yeah, like they said, it's going to be uh, expanding. I think he said till what the twenty first. I believe he so, said there. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, either way, if anything goes with how the trends have been recently, that'll probably get extended because you know the horror community loves to show up for these things. Um, but yeah, other than that, you guys, if you are looking for tickets, you are interested, you can go to fathomevents.com and find those there. Uh, we do have a link in the uh, description here. So if you are interested, if this interview sold you, uh, then definitely go grab your tickets. I assume once this thing hits, they are going to go fast. And uh, yeah, I, I'm excited for it. We will be there. And uh, yeah, dude, I, I hope that uh, this is great. And then we can continue on with uh more Winnie the Pooh, Bambi, uh, Peter Pan, and God knows what else they have in store for us. Because, yeah, they they definitely seem like they've got a, a wide net cast on a bunch of characters they want to bring to the slasher genre. 
Yeah, I'm certainly intrigued. They kind of gave us that little little tidbit there of like they have a, a couple of characters that you know not, aren't even in our vision, a line of vision yet to uh, bring to uh, the big screen. So I'm curious to see what they're going to be pulling out. Uh, definitely seems intriguing, and just like this film, I can't wait to see it. Absolutely. But alrighty, guys, that's going to wrap us up here for this interview. Thank you again for checking this out and supporting the channel. If you're new here and you're just discovering us, please hit that subscribe button. We are on our way to a thousand subscribers and yeah, we're getting mighty close. We are, uh, I think at the time of recording this at 630. So thank you so much for responding. Um, and of course, we got a lot of great content coming your guys' way. Uh, we got Sunday Scaries coming to you here. We've got, uh, you know, we just had The Last of Us uh, episode drop on Friday, so we have that video up for you guys to to watch, as well as uh, to plug another movie that just came out over uh, this past uh, weekend. We have The Outwaters review up for you guys to check that out as well. Uh, it's a good time to be a horror fan, man. What can I say? And uh, yeah, if you uh, want to stay up with all the latest and greatest, please, again, hit that subscribe button, follow us on social media, and uh, yeah, keep it right here with us. So uh, I guess that without further ado, that does it for us here. So until next time, I'm Dylan Newell. And I'm Luke Janesco. And remember, stay scared.